65 years after the first women's rights convention, women still didn't have the right to vote in most states. Activists decided to march on Washington in what would become one of the most violent and chaotic episodes in the fight for women's suffrage. It was held in Washington, D.C. on March 3rd, the day before Woodrow Wilson would be sworn in as the 28th president. The National American Women's Suffrage Association had announced that its members would march down Pennsylvania Avenue to demand a constitutional amendment giving them the right to vote. At least 5,000 suffragettes from across the country had announced they'd take part. Many of them made well-publicized hikes to Washington, like this group from New Jersey. They expected to meet jeering and protesting across the parade route. Most Americans in that year were still opposed to women's suffrage, which meant many of the suffragettes marching that day had already faced opposition from their friends and family members. So they didn't expect a wholly supportive crowd, but they couldn't have foreseen what they met. Another crowd had traveled to Washington that weekend to see the inauguration. Many visitors had begun celebrating early, and city officials expected they'd interfere with the march. They suggested the women march at a later date on a less visible street. But knowing the value this exposure would give the cause, the women kept their original schedule and route. By 3 p.m., the marchers had lined up and were starting down Pennsylvania Avenue. They hadn't got far before men broke through the cables that kept them on the sidewalk, and they swarmed in on the women. They jeered and insulted the women, spitting on them and grabbing their clothing. They jostled and shoved, and through verbal abuse, lighted cigarettes and trash. Some grabbed the banners the women were carrying, and others tried climbing on the floats. The suffragettes were barely making progress through the men. After an hour of struggling, the women had advanced just one block. Many were injured as they were knocked down, and ambulance drivers had to fight their way through the crowd to reach them. Over 100 women were rushed to local emergency rooms to treat their injuries. The police were seen to do little to restore order, and when it was observed that some were joining in on the harassment, the city authorities called in the cavalry. A detachment of mounted troops from nearby Fort Myer rode up and cleared a path for the women. They were aided by National Guardsmen as well as young men from the Maryland Agricultural College who created a channel for the marchers. Eventually, the women completed the march, along with their four mounted brigades, 24 floats, and nine bands. But by day's end, local hospitals had treated over 200 for injuries. The Post's editors were outraged by the news of women peaceably exercising their rights, being trampled by what they called edifying representatives of the muscular sex some of whom were drunk. They believe in women's inherent inferiority, and the more inferior the man is, the more tenaciously he clings to that notion. Naturally, the National American Women's Suffrage Association was shocked by the mayhem. Organizer Alice Paul claimed it showed the government was incapable of ensuring women's physical safety, but the turmoil and harassment worked in the women's favor. Rather than discouraging recruits, as the New York Tribune headline read, Capital mobs made converts to suffrage.